Hi, fourth grade. So we are on part three of our read aloud. Um, we left our protagonist, Oladua, um, the kidnapped prince, in a ship where they had just had a battle with some friendships um, in passing, and they were able to go and move on to England, where they were heading. So we are going to continue on, and hopefully we will finish this book tomorrow. So the next chapter is called Betrayed. In the beginning of December 1762, the war was ended. We got orders to go up to London with our ship to be paid off. Besides our salaries, we would each get a share of the prize money, the money the Navy would pay for us all for the French ships we had captured that had been refitted or sold. We all cheered and shouted huzzah when we heard the news of peace. I shared the joy. I was almost 17 now. All I could think of was, was being freed and working for myself and earning the money to get a good education. Captain Pascal had not promised me freedom outright, but he had always treated me with the greatest kindness. He even paid attention to my morals. He never let me deceive him or tell lies. He told me that if I did, God would not love me. Because he always treated me very tenderly, I never thought that he would keep me with him any longer than I wished. On the Etna, there was a man named Daniel Queen, who was also a steward to my master, the captain. He taught me how to shave, how to cut hair. We read the Bible together. Many a time we sat up the whole night while I told him of the customs of my country and how much they were like the customs of the Jews in the Bible. I loved Daniel Queen almost like a father. When I won money from other boys playing marbles or got some money for shaving someone, I didn't spend it on myself. Instead, I'd use it to buy sugar or tobacco for him. Daniel Queen told me he and I would never part. When our ship was paid off, he said, I would be as free as himself or any other man on board. We would go to London and I could live with him. He would teach me his business so I could earn a good living. His promises gave me new life. My heart burned with the desire for freedom. The few days before I gained it seemed very long. We sailed from Portsmouth to the Thames and arrived at Deptford the 10th of December. It was high water and we cast anchor. Suddenly, a half hour later, my master ordered the barge to be manned. In an instant, he forced me into it. You want to leave me, he shouted down from the deck, but I will see to it that you don't. I was so amazed I couldn't answer him. Finally, I said, I'll get my books and my chests and my clothes. I swear you won't move out of my sight, he said. He pulled out his saber. If you move, he said, I'll cut your throat. I began to collect myself and plucked up my courage. I am a free man, he responded. I responded, and by law, you cannot serve me so. But this only enraged him more, and he continued to swear. I'll soon let you know whether I can or not, he shouted, and he sprang into the barge from the ship. The whole crew watched him with astonishment and sorrow. Unluckily for me, the tide had just turned out. Quickly, it carried us down the river toward the sea till we came among some ships bound for the West Indies. My master was resolved to put me on board the first vessel he could get to receive me. The boat's crew pulled against their will. Several times they stopped rowing. They would have rowed to shore, but he would not let them. Some of them tried to cheer me. He can't sell you, they said. We'll stand by you. They revived me a little. They pulled alongside several ships. Captain Pascal asked them to take me on, but they refused. I still had hope. But just as we had got to show... Just as we had gotten a little below Gravesend, we came alongside a ship outward bound on the next tide. She was bound for the West Indies, and her name was the Charming Sally. Captain James Duran was in charge of her. My master went on board to bargain over me. In a little while, I was sent for in the cabin. I went in. Do you know me? Captain Duran asked. I do not, I answered, said Captain Duran. You are now my slave. My master can't sell me to you or anyone. Why, said he, did your master buy you? I confessed he did, but I have served him, said I, for many years, and he has taken all my wages and prize money, for I only got sixpence during the war. Besides this, I have been baptized, and by the laws of the land, no man has a right to sell me. And I added that I heard a lawyer and others at different times tell my master so. 
My former master said, if your prize money had been 10,000 pounds, I had a right to it all, and I would have taken it. Captain Duran then said, the people who tell you he can't sell you are not your friends, and my old master agreed with him. It is extraordinary, I said, that other people don't know the law as well as you. You talk too much English, Captain Duran said. If you don't behave yourself and be quiet, I have a method bound to make you. I knew his power over me. I didn't doubt what he said. I remembered my suffering in the slave ship, and inwardly I shuddered. As I cannot get justice among men, I said. I hope I will in heaven af hereafter. I immediately left the cabin, filled with resentment and sorrow. When I came on deck, some of my old shipmates told me not to despair. This ship isn't sailing right away, they said. It will stop in Portsmouth and wait for a convoy. As soon as we get our pay, we'll come to you there and we'll get you back. My master soon concluded his bargain with the captain and came out of the cabin to me. He made me take off my coat, the only one I had with me, and give it to him. I had about nine guineas with me, all the money I managed to save in all my years at sea. I hid it that instant so he wouldn't get that too. It would help me if some other way or other I could make escape to shore. The captain, my friends, and the crew got the boat and put off. I followed them with aching eyes as long as I could. When they were out of sight, I threw myself on the deck, my heart ready to burst with sorrow and anguish. Hopes of Rescue I cried very bitterly for some time. Then I began to think I must have done something to, to displease God. He was punishing me so severely. I thought about my past conduct and remembered something. The morning we arrived in Deptford, I had said to myself, when we reach London, I swear I'll spend the whole day having fun. Now my conscience smote me for this casual expression because I had sworn. I begged God's forgiveness. I prayed for him not to abandon me nor cast me from his mercy forever. In a little, while my grief was spent with its own violence, it began to subside. My first confusion was over, and I thought with more calmness. I considered that trials and disappointments are sometimes for our good. These thoughts gave me a little comfort. I got up from the deck with dejection and sorrow in my face, yet with some faint hope that God would deliver me. Soon afterward, my new master was going on shore. He called me to him. Behave yourself, he said, and do your work as well as the other boys. You will be treated better for it. I did not answer him. Can you swim, he asked. I said no. However, I was made to go under the deck and was carefully washed. The next tide the ship got under way and soon arrived at the mother bank, Portsmouth, where she waited a few days for some of the West India convoy. The captain was careful to give me no chance of escape. He didn't allow any strange boats to come alongside our ship. When he came up in our boat, it was hoisted immediately. I tried every means I could devise among the people of the ship to get me a boat from the shore. A sailor on board took a guinea from me, saying he would get me a boat. Every hour he promised me that it would soon arrive. When he had the watch on deck, I watched also. I looked down the river for hours. It was all in vain. I never saw the boat or my money. Still worse, the sailor gave information to the mates. He told them that I wanted to escape, but he never told them that he had stolen a guinea from me, promising to help me. However, after we had sailed, I told the crew his trick. He was detested and despised by them all. I was still in hope that my old shipmates would not forget their promise to come to me in Portsmouth. The day before we sailed, some of them did get to Port Portsmouth. They sent me some oranges and other presents, and they sent word that would come to me, that would come to see me themselves the next day or the day after. Also, a lady who had once been very close to my former master sent me a letter. She had always shown me great friendship and had wanted to make me her servant. In her letter, she said she would come and take me out of the ship. However, the next morning, the 13th of December, 1762, the frigate Aeolus was to escort the convoy made the signal for sailing. All ships raised anchor. Before any of my friends had the chance to help me, our ship got underway. All my hope was gone. I was a prisoner and I could not help myself. I looked back to land, my eyes swimming in tears. In one day's time, the land was out of sight. I was ready to curse the tide and the wind and even the ship that led us, but the fleet sailed on. I wished 
that I had never been born. Sorry. Land of bondage. The turbulence of my emotions soon gave way to calmer thoughts. I realized that what fate had decreed, no mortal could prevent. We sailed through calm sea for six weeks, and on the 13th of February, 1763, we saw our destined island, Montserrat. At the end of the land of bondage, horror went through me and chilled my heart. I remembered my former slavery with its misery, lashing, and chains. I begged God to strike me dead with lightning rather than to let me be a slave and sold from lord to lord. Our ship anchored. I was ordered to help discharge our cargo, loading and unloading the boat. And then I learned what it was to work hard in the scorching West Indian sun. Heavy surf tossed the boat and the people in it so high that sometimes our bones were broken. Every day I was bruised and mangled, and in the midst of my work, two sailors robbed me of all my money and ran away from the ship. About the middle of May, the ship would return to England without me. I could feel fate's blackest clouds gather, gathering over my head. I thought that when they burst, they would mix me with the dead. One morning, Captain Duran sent for his shore, sent for me on shore. His messenger told me that my fate was decided. I came to the captain. He was with Mr. Robert King, a Quaker and the most important merchant in Montserrat. Your captain. Your master, Captain Pascal, sent you here to be sold, Captain Moran said. But he said you were a very deserving boy. He asked me to find the best master possible for you. I have seen that you are deserving, the captain added. And if I were going to stay in the West Indies, I would be glad to keep you myself. But I don't, take, I don't dare take you to London. If you get there, you will leave me. I burst out a crying and begged him to take me to England, but all to no purpose. You will have the very best master... You will have the very best master in the whole island, he said. You'll be as happy with him as you would be in England. I could have sold you to my own brother-in-law for a great deal more money, but just so you'll be happy, I'm letting Mr. King have you. I've bought you because you're good character, said my new master, Mr. King. You'll be very well off with me. He told me he did not live in the West Indies, but in Philadelphia. He was going there soon. Since I understood some arithmetic, when we got there, he would put me in school and train me to be a clerk. This conversation relieved my mind a little bit. I left these men very thankful to Captain Duran and even my old master, Captain Pascal, for the good references they had given me. I went on board again to say goodbye to all my shipmates. The next day, the ship sailed. When it was out of sight, I was so grief-stricken that I couldn't hold up my head for many months. If Mr. King had not been kind to me, I believe I should have died from the grief. But I soon found out that he was as good as master as Captain Duran had said so, for he was very kind. If any of his slaves behaved amiss, he did not beat or mistreat them, he only sold them. This made them afraid of offending him. He treated his slaves better than any man on the island, so he was better and more faithfully served by them in return. Because of his kind treatment, I finally recovered from my grief and determined to face whatever fate had in store. Mr. King told me he didn't mean to treat me as a common slave and asked me what I could do. I told him I knew something of seamanship and that he could and could shave and cut hair pretty well. I could refine wines, which I'd learned on the shipboard, where I had often done it, and I could write and understand arithmetic tolerably well. Mr. King dealt in all kinds of merchandise and kept one to six clerks. He loaded many vessels in a year, particularly in Philadelphia, where he was born. He had many different sized vessels and dodgers that went out to the island to collect rum, sugar, and other goods. I knew how to row boats and manage them well. This hard work was the first he gave me. In the sugar seasons, it was all I did. Sometimes I rowed the boat and slaved at the oars as much as 16 hours a day. He paid me 15 pence sterling per day to live on, though sometimes only 10 pence. However, this was much more than was allowed to other slaves who used to work with me. These slaves belong to other gentlemen. These slaves belong to other gentlemen on the island. 
They rented them to Mr. King for three or four shillings a day, but their masters never gave them more than nine pence a day, and seldom more than six pence to buy their food. Sometimes, after these slaves had worked all day and their owners had been paid, they refused to give the slaves their share. Often, slaves were supposed to collect their own four shillings to pay for their owners. On Sunday, which was their only free day, the men who had rented them kept them waiting all day long for their pay. Then, when they brought the money to their owners, the owners would get mad for bringing it late. One slave I knew who delivered his wages the same day, but late, was staked to the ground for his delay. His master often rented slaves at two and a half shillings per day and fed the slaves himself. He knew their owners didn't feed them enough for the heavy work they did. These slaves liked my master very much. They worked for him in preference to any man on the island. Many slaves on the island can't collect their pay at all. They are afraid of getting in trouble if they return without it, so they run away to whatever shelter they can find. Then their masters put up a reward to bring them in dead or alive. My master in these cases used to bargain with the owners and buy the slaves himself. He saved many of them, and in some cases, he may have saved their lives. In many of the estates where I used to be sent to pick up rum or sugar, they would not deliver it to me, or to any other Negro. Mr. King sent a white man along with me to those places. He used to pay the white man from six to ten shillings a day. From working like this, I saw everything about how the poor slaves were treated. I was pleased... I pleased my master in every job I worked at. Often I worked on board his ships. Sometimes I received and delivered cargoes. Sometimes I delivered goods to stores. Besides that, I shaved Mr. King and fixed his hair and took care of his horse. He told me that I saved him more than a hundred pounds a year, and I was more useful than any of his white clerks. But his clerks earned sixty to a hundred pounds a year. People said that a slave never earns back for his master the money that has been paid for him. This is not even logical. If it were true, why would gentlemen have continued to buy slaves? The people who claim this, of course, are the biggest supporters of the slave trade. In fact, nothing can be further from the truth. Ninety percent of the skilled labor in the West Indies are Negro slaves, and most earn two dollars a day, and even more for their masters. I have known many slaves whose masters would not take a thousand pounds for them. Various gentlemen who didn't feed or clothe their slaves offered my master a hundred guineas for me, but he always told them he would not sell me. Whenever they made an offer, I used to double my diligence to avoid getting into their hands. My, many of those slave owners used to find fault with my master for feeding his slaves so well. He told them that the slaves looked better well fed and did more work, and yet I often went hungry. It was the year 1763. I was 18 years old and when I got the chance for a better life. One of my master's vessels, a Bermuda sloop about 60 tons burden, carried passengers from island to island. It was commanded by Captain Thomas Farmer, a very alert and active man who made my master a great deal of money. Often his sailors used to run away from the ship, which hindered his business very much. Captain Farmer had taken a liking to me. Repeatedly, he begged my master to let me journey with him as a sailor. Finally, my master consented, but he gave, my, he gave Captain Farmer stern instructions not to let me run away. If he did, he said he would make Captain Farmer pay for me. I made short trips with the captain and became so helpful to him that he wanted me all the time. He told my master, Gustavus is more useful than any three white men, and he was right. The white men used to behave badly in many ways. They would smash the boat that went to shore against rocks just to delay the next trip and get out of any work while the boat was being repaired. My master wanted me on shore, but at last he gave in and gave me, gave me my choice of slaving on land or sea. I was very happy at the idea of going to the sea. At sea, I might get a chance of earning a little money or maybe of making a skate. I also expected to get better food and more of it. After I sailed a while with Captain Farmer, I decided to try my skill as a merchant. It was risky. I only had three pence. If I lost that, I would have nothing. But I trusted in the Lord to help me. I spent the three pence on a glass tumbler. I bought it on the Dutch island of St. Eustadia on Montserrat, and I sold it for six pence. On the next trip, I told the six 
I took the six pence and bought two tumblers more. I sold them again on Monsterat for double, a whole shilling. I continued buying and selling like this in the space of the month I had a dollar. I felt like I was rich. Then I decided to try for even more money, three times more than I had ever made in any sale. An old black man was sent by his master to work with us as a sailor. He and I put all of our money into oranges, lemons, and limes to sell on the island of Santa Cruz. He bought one bag of fruit, I bought two, six shillings worth, that I knew could sell for 18 shillings. We had just got off the boat in Santa Cruz when two white soldiers came up to us and took our bags of fruit. We thought it was a joke at first until they didn't give us our fruit back. We followed them down the road, begging for our fruit all the way. They went into a house near the fort and closed the door. We knocked. Get out of here, they said. This fruit is everything we have, I said. We're strangers here. We're from a different island. We just came on that ship, and we pointed to it. But telling them that was a mistake. Now they knew we were strangers, as well as slaves. They went on swearing, And seeing that they meant what they said, we left in the greatest confusion and despair. Instead of having 27 shillings, we had nothing. I had, hoped to, I had hoped to make three times more money than I had ever made. Now I would be starting all over again from nothing. I didn't have a penny. We went back to the house and begged again for our fruit. Finally, some other people heard us and came out. They asked if we would be content if they kept one bag and gave us back two. We had no choice. The old man's bag had lemons and oranges mixed, so they kept it and gave me my two bags. Immediately, I took my bags and ran as fast as I could. My friend stayed behind me to plead for his bag. They gave him nothing. When he caught up with me, he cried so bitterly for his loss that I was moved to pity. I gave him one third of my fruit. We went to the market then, and we sold our fruit uncommonly well. I got 37 bits, $3.70 for my share. Such a strange reversal of fortune made reality seem like a dream more than ever. After that, when I had similar problems, Captain Farmer took my side and kept many good Christians from robbing me. The Horrors of the West Indies Before I left England, I had lived in freedom and plenty. Every place I had ever lived was a paradise compared to the West Indies. I thought of freedom every hour. If possible, I wanted to get free by honorable means, but I believed that whatever fate had determined would come to pass. If it was my lot to be freed, I should be, no matter how apparently hopeless my situation. If it was not my lot to be freed, I never would be. I went on for about four years with Captain Farmer from one island to another, another trading... In that time, I became the master of a few pounds and on my way to making more. My friendly captain knew about my money. Sometimes it seemed to make him envious, and he treated me angrily. Every time he did, I told him plainly how I felt. I said that if he didn't treat me well, I wouldn't sail with him. I said that I would die before I was mis mistreated. To me, I said life had no relish when liberty was gone. I told him this. Even though I knew all my hopes and freedoms, humanly speaking, depended on him, when I threatened him so, he always became mild. He couldn't bear for me to leave him. I took good care of his business and gained him credit with my master. And through this kindness to me, I at last procured my liberty. So I lived filled with thoughts and freedom and resisting bad treatment as well as I was able. And all the time my life was in danger. Every day I faced the devouring fury and howling rage of the surf. Once I saw the surf strike a boat and toss it up, toss it end and cripple several men on board. Once, in the Granada Islands, when I and eight others were rowing a large boat with two puncheons of water in it, surf hit us. The boat flew with all of us in it, about half of the stone's throw. We landed among some trees, far above the high water mark. One night we were rowing hard to get off shore. The surf tipped the boat over four times. The first time I very nearly drowned. The jacket I had kept on me above water a little while, and I called out to a man, nearly a good, a man near me a good swimmer. He caught hold of me and pulled me close enough to shore so I could stand, and then he rescued the boat. Every day I wished to see my master keep his promise of leaving the West Indies and taking me to Philadelphia. But while I was dreaming of freedom, a very cruel thing happened that filled me with horror. 
when we were we were off of Montserrat and free young mulatto man, Joseph Clipson, was with us. He was a boat builder. Everyone on the ship knew that he had been free since birth. He had a free woman for a wife and a child and a very happy life. One day, a captain from Bermuda and several of his men came board our ship. The captain told Joseph he wasn't free and said his master had given him orders to take him away to Bermuda. Joseph couldn't believe the captain was serious. He showed a certificate of being born free in Satan Kitts, but the captain paid no attention. His men grabbed Joseph and took him out of our ship by force. He asked the captors to take him ashore to a judge, and those infernal invaders, invaders of human rights, promised him they would. But instead of that, they put him on their ship, and the next day they carried him away. He had no chance for a hearing, no chance to even see his wife or child. Very likely, in the rest of his life, he never saw them again. Before this, I only thought dra- slavery was dreadful, but afterward, I thought the life of the free Negro in the West Indies was as bad or even worse. In the West Indies, a free Negro, a free Negro can't give evidence in the court of law. When he is robbed, he can't get a hearing in court, and the threat of kidnapping and reenslavement always hangs over his head. But I was still a slave. If I was caught running away or accused of a crime, anyone could kill me and never be punished for it. If I was simply slaving, as I was supposed to, anyone could still kill me. Paying only the small fine of 15 pounds for the crime of bloody-mindedness. There was a white man once who wanted to steal some pigs I was selling. He came on the ship, refused to pay me, and looked for my money box to break into and take my money. To protect my goods and my dignity, I would have hit him and been sent to jail. But a British sailor defended me. The thief went away swearing the next time he saw me, he would kill me and pay the government 15 pounds for my life. I was completely disgusted with the West Indies. From the time I saw Joseph Clipson carried away, I knew I would never be completely free until I left them. In the West Indies, the fear of losing his freedom is always with the free black man. Okay, so that was part three of our book. We will hopefully finish this tomorrow, if not one day next week. So my question for you this time is how does the experience of our kidnapped prince relate or not relate to what we've been learning? So all these videos kaylin has been talking about and showing you through has been talking about a very specific time in a very specific area. Do we see our character in this story going through this or is it a little bit different? So comment below your answer, and I hope you enjoyed the story. Bye.